join in singing the next <laughs> six hundred.
Jonah chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to sing that the Alleluia is about to be. <coughs> And immediately he called them. 
him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord from Mark 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Dear friends in Christ Jesus our Lord, history is full of final straws. A king rules and people grumble. The king keeps ruling and people keep grumbling. The tension increases until the situation is ripe for rebellion and bloodshed as the people measure their strength and contemplate revolution. Things could go bad quickly from there and that's when the king is even more vigilant than usual. In our gospel lesson, Herod had just put John the Baptist in prison. He wasn't happy about it. He was afraid of John. But he just couldn't allow John the Baptist to go running around preaching that Herod's new marriage was a sinful one, what with his adulterous union uh, to his brother's wife and all, What John said was all true, and he preached it not to foment rebellion, but to call Herod to repentance. But a king just couldn't have critics like that speaking inconvenient truths, so he put the popular prophet into prison. How would the people react? This was a tense moment for Herod, waiting to see if the people would rise up or just accept the arrest of John. What happened next sounds like it could have been a big problem. A man arrived in Galilee and started proclaiming, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It wasn't just any man either. It was the man, Jesus, from Nazareth. This wasn't just a follower or colleague of John the Baptist. No, John declared that it was his calling to prepare the way for Jesus, that Jesus was the one with divine power and authority. Now that John was behind bars and done talking, this Jesus showed up and he started talking. And if Herod was afraid of John, he was probably a little nervous about Jesus, especially when Jesus started saying things like, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It was time for a new kingdom. And a different kingdom meant a different king. It sounded like the rallying cry for a revolution, as if Jesus' next sermon was going to be, let's get rid of King Herod, that God might rule over us instead. And if the multitudes that loved John the Baptist decided to rally behind Jesus, then Herod could have a serious problem on his hands. All of Galilee, both friend and foe, were hanging on to Jesus' words. If it was time for this kingdom of God to be at hand, then how would it come about? Jesus told them. He said, Repent 
and believe in the gospel. It wasn't your usual revolutionary speech. It wasn't take up your arms, draw your swords, and prepare for battle. It was repent and believe in the gospel. Repent. By the grace of God, turn from your sin. Believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news that the long-promised king has come to save you from your sin. Every kingdom has enemies, and this new kingdom was no different. But the enemies of this kingdom that Jesus proclaimed were not Herod or Pilate or Caesar. The enemies of this kingdom were sin and death and hell. The devil. Sin and death and devil were not going to be defeated with swords and rebellion against human rulers. They were going to be defeated by the shedding of the Savior's blood on the cross. In this new kingdom, Herod was not the enemy nor the competition. Herod was a ruler of an entirely different kingdom, and this Savior came to redeem him. Repent and believe in the gospel. This should allay a lot of Herod's fears. Now, a king is nothing without followers, and having proclaimed that this good news, this new kingdom had come, Jesus began to recruit he didn't go after Roman soldiers, temple guards, or other trained killers. He went for fishermen. He picked up Simon and Andrew, James and John. He would gather a few more like a tax collector along the way, but his army consisted of 12 men who generally got no respect and possessed no fighting skills. Herod had nothing to fear from Simon or Andrew, James, and John, unless his own troops were composed of fish. If this is a kingdom about believing the gospel, it didn't need an army, it needed mouth mouths to speak the gospel. There was one more consideration. A king was nothing without a kingdom, and that meant territory. Herod had to be on the lookout because groups had been known to carve out a, a little bit of land and set up their own little community, or Perhaps this Jesus still planned to take over Galilee by nonviolent means. But this was a different sort of kingdom. It didn't have a set location. This kingdom moved around wherever the king was. That's where the kingdom was. A kingdom of repentance and faith didn't require land because it wasn't about crops, water, steel, or other material things. Why, someone could conceivably be a penitent who believed in the gospel and still served faithfully in the palace of King Herod. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. These were Jesus' first words, his first sermon in the gospel of Mark. They set the stage, they defined the king and 
the kingdom, contrary to the fears of Herod and the hopes of Herod's enemies, this new kingdom was not about conquering Herod and Caesar. It was about conquering sin, death, and the devil for all people, Herod and Caesar included. It wasn't about gathering soldiers, wealth, power, or land. It was about forgiving sins and giving eternal salvation. Throughout the Gospels, you see King Jesus going about the establishment of his kingdom. He didn't fight, but he spoke. He worked wonders and healed but he didn't say, now you owe me a favor that I'll call in later, but follow me because I have more to give. He fed 5,000 miraculously, but he didn't use food as leverage to field an army. In fact, when they tried to make him a king like all the other kings of earth, he refused and went on his way. Significantly, a Roman centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus did so, and he didn't require the centurion to switch alliances and renounce Caesar. Instead, Jesus would have the centurion be a Roman soldier and a penitent Christian at the same time. This is completely a different kingdom and a completely different kingdom and king it was. He was no threat to Herod or Caesar on the contrary, he told people to pay their taxes to Herod and Caesar. In fact, the more people followed Jesus, the better citizens they were for Herod and Caesar both, for they were penitent Christians who t submitted to human authorities and acknowledged that they were placed there by God. It's so tragically ironic then that Jesus was crucified for being this different king. His crown on earth was made of thorns and his throne a cross. The accusation above his head on the cross declared him worthy of death because he was the king of the Jews. He was crucified on the orders of a reluctant Pilate. In fact, when Pilate interrogated Jesus, Jesus told Pilate that Pilate had authority to rule only because he had given it to him. And then Jesus submitted to Pilate's rule and allowed himself to be crucified. This is a remarkably different kind of king indeed. If all this doesn't set the kingdom of God apart, Jesus' death was not a defeat. It was a victory. By his death, he defeated sin and death and devil. By his sacrifice, he had salvation for all who repented and believed in the gospel, the gospel that God forgave them for the sake of Jesus. One of the greatest struggles for the church on earth today is to remain the kingdom of God. Christians are always tempted to become another earthly kingdom in one form or another. Another way to put this is the Lord Jesus Christ would have his church continue to proclaim repentance and the gospel, the good news that turns sinners into the forgiven people of God. 
as long as we live in this world, the church will be tempted to turn from a message of sin and grace to messages of worldly matters. When it does so, it becomes just another kingdom and usually a bad one at that. Here's how it should be. The church must continue to faithfully preach the Lord's word. People hear the word and believe and thus become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. But people are still members of the kingdoms of this world and they are to be good citizens there too. Thus, as citizens of God set free from the slavery of sin, they labor in this world to do good by loving their neighbor. Throughout history, you've seen a pattern. Wherever the church is, there is an increase in education, respect for women, the unborn, humanitarian efforts, and the like. In other words, wherever the kingdom of God is found on earth, the kingdoms of the world improve. By making the world a better place is not the mission of the church. Making the world a better place is a byproduct of Christianity as people set free from sin, love their neighbor, but it's never to be the focus of the church. The focus of the church is always repentance and forgiveness of sins, always the proclamation of Christ, and him crucified. The Middle Ages gave an obvious historical example. Over time, the church had gained enough power and wealth that it positioned itself to run society. The church taught that it was the privilege of the Pope to crown kings, to set prices, to control the economy, to field armies and wage wars. This power was waning at the time of Martin Luther, though the claims had not ceased. When Luther wrote that the mission of the church was to preach the gospel, he was sentenced to death by the church. The church sought to use its worldly power to stamp out the preaching of salvation by grace alone. Just one example of a big temptation. Christians are always tempted to leave the gospel because they want Christianity to be about changing earthly kingdoms and secular matters. One example would be the elections in our nation. As we draw closer to the next presidential election, there will be news stories about Christian leaders who say that we must have a Christian president to rule over our nation and that it's better for a Christian not to vote than to vote for a non-Christian. Ironically, those denominations which most condemn the Roman Catholic Church for claiming the right of the Pope to preside over secular matters will usually insist that we must have a Christian president to govern our nation. It's the same teaching in both camps. It's the teaching that the kingdom of God exists on earth because Christians establish Christian rules and Christian nations by enacting Christian laws. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for Christian rulers and laws that reflect the moral law of God. On this 
life someday, we acknowledge that elective abortion is a terrible sin in our nation, and Christian citizens do well to work for laws to protect the unborn. Well, that's good, but it's not how the kingdom of God exists in the world. The kingdom of God exists in this world wherever the gospel is preached and wherever the gospel is given in baptism and holy communion. If that takes place in a nation that is predominantly Christian, then the church is there. If that takes place in, in a Cuba or a, a Nazi Germany or a communist China or an Iran, then the kingdom of God is there. It's an entirely different different kingdom. Thus, I'm told that Martin Luther remarked that when it came to rulers, he would take a competent Turk, that is, a Muslim, over an incompetent Christian. Even as we continue to pray for our nation to say that a president must be a Christian to be qualified to be president, is a statement of false doctrine. The United States is not the kingdom of God. It is a kingdom of this world in which we happen to live and in which, thankfully, at least for now, the church is allowed to proclaim the gospel freely. But the kingdom of God is an entirely different kingdom. <coughs> this is a stone over which you will stumble to. You'll want to measure the relevance of Jesus by matters of this world. You'll want to measure the effectiveness of the kingdom of God by whether or not your sickness is healed or your pain is relieved by whether or not the tensions in your family are resolved or you succeed in your line of work, by whether or not the laws of the land reflect God's moral law. You'll want Christ as king if he works out your concerns in the kingdom of this world. And if all he does is forgive your sins and gives you eternal life, you'll be tempted to be disappointed. Now the Lord rules over this world and he is concerned with your life in this kingdom. He may grant healing and deliverance, he may resolve tensions in your family or grant you a glorious career. He may do so miraculously, working wonders, but these results are not the focus of the church. Repentance and the gospel are. If the Lord allows pain or sickness or Tension to remain, it does not mean that he is a weak king. He is the Almighty God who rules over all things, and there's no doubt of the forgiveness and life he has won for you. Remember, Jesus is king of an entirely different kingdom. It's not about wealth or power or success for you here on earth. It's all about life eternal in the kingdom of heaven. It's not about your works and labors to achieve rewards, but about his death on the cross as a sacrifice to win that salvation for you. 
You are a citizen of this kingdom by the grace of God, by repentance and faith in the gospel. This kingdom is at hand because your king is as near to you as his word and sacraments, and where the king is, there is his kingdom. The kingdom of God is yours forever because you are forgiven for all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding to your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Stand for prayer.
my body which is given for you. This do with remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new testament in my blood, shed for the remission of sins. This do as often as he drank it. Lord, we can always.
Drink, which is the true blood of our Lord. 